So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sleep 101. I am Dr. Mariska Brown and I'm the director of the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research. And I wanna thank you all for joining us to our event. Uh, sleep 101 Symposium highlights advances and opportunities in sleep and circadian science and research. One of the strategic goals in the new NIH Sleep Research Plan, which was launched in December 2021, specifically addresses sleep health disparities or the differences in one or more of the dimensions of sleep health that adversely affect designated disadvantaged populations. There's a critical need to better understand how these differences in sleep within diverse populations contribute to health disparities across populations. So today we will hear from the following experts on sleep health disparities and sleep in special populations. We wanna first introduce Dr. Carmela Alcantara at Columbia University, who will then be followed by Dr. Ignacio Tapia at the University of Pennsylvania or the Children's, Hosp the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania and Dr. Suzanne or Susie Burdich from Harvard University. We would like to ask everyone to please submit your questions for the live Q&A that will be followed by the presentations. And so beginning, we will have Dr. Carmen Alcantara. Carmela? Uh, you're muted. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for that terrific um, uh, introduction. If I could just share a screen. Okay, all right, terrific. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you joining from the uh, East Coast and good morning if there's folks joining from the West Coast. Um, as was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Brown, my name is Carmela Alcantara. I'm an Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Doctoral Education at Columbia School of Social Work. Um, and I just wanna thank the National Center for uh, on Sleep Disparities Research, American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society for the invitation to present um, today as part of this panel. I'm delighted to talk about sleep health um, equity and share with you some, um, I think key sort of perspectives and insight from my point of view and some future directions. These are my conflicts of um, interest, but they are not related to the material I'll present in this lecture. In terms of our learning objectives today, um, at the conclusion of this talk, I hope we'll uh, be able to define health disparities and health equity research and key frameworks. Um, secondly, we'll be able to describe sleep health disparities and its determinants. Um, and then lastly, uh, we'll uh, spend some time identifying current scientific trends, gaps, and opportunities for future research on sleep health disparities and its determinants. And just in terms of an outline, how we're gonna get there, I feel like the first third of the talk will focus on these key definitions and terms. Um, we'll move on to provide a 50,000 foot view of sleep and sleep disparities. And lastly, really conclude with, I think the more exciting parts, which is just some um, thoughts on scientific trends, gaps and opportunities. Um, so, you know, just in terms of orienting you to, uh, to who I am, so I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training, and I have uh, postdoctoral um, expertise in social epidemiology and behavioral medicine, and I do both observational research on social determinants of sleep, mental health, and cardiovascular health with specific attention to understanding the role of sleep and cardiovascular health disparities. And then I also am very passionate about intervention-based research that addresses, um, in and in particular, equity issues in mental health care um, um, issues and particularly behavioral sleep medicine. And so I've done research in the areas of Latinx immigrant health, psychosocial context and cardiovascular health and sleep disparities. So some of my um, recommendations I think will reflect a lot of this interdisciplinary research. So let's start with some of these key definitions uh, in health disparities and health equity research. Um, and I wanna start by really, I think, highlighting uh, some definitions that were provided in a seminal paper by Paula Braveman um, uh, in 2011. And really, you know, bear with me as I read these, but I think it's actually really quite imp impactful and important to begin with a shared understanding of what these concepts refer to. The first point that is made in this paper 
uh, in terms of key de definitions that, that is that health disparities or health differences that adversely affect socially disadvantaged groups. Secondly, health disparities are a systematic and plausibly avoidable health differences according to various different social identities, which are listed here. Um, and these social identities are associated with uh, discrimination or, or marginalization. The third important point is that health disparities do not generically refer to all health differences or even to all health differences warranting focus attention. So it's really um, uh, paying, um, uh, highlighting specific subset of health differences that are particularly relevant to social justice in part because of their connection to structural racism or, or um, discrimination or, or marginalization that reflect and reinforce social disadvantage. And then the last point that I think is relevant for our discussion today um, is that disparities in health and its determinants are the metrics or the rule book for assessing health equity. And that means health equity here is the principle that underlies the commitment to reducing disparities in health and its determinants. So health equity is about the principles, it's about social justice in health, and you know, the reduction and elimination of health disparities is actually the metric by which we measure if we're actually advancing towards health equity. So I just think it's a powerful, um, some powerful key definitions to keep in mind as we uh, talk today. And then, you know, um, secondly, just uh, in terms of some key background, I think it's also important to highlight just how relatively uh, new this focus on health disparities is in the United States. Uh, and this, this is a Google Ngram, which really just uh, captures popularity of word usage over time. And what I want to draw your attention to is that you know, the, the focus on health disparities really began with the Heckler Report, as many of you listening may know, which was published in 1985 and was one of the first in the United States to document uh, health disparities among racial and ethnic uh, minority communities compared to whites. This was followed by, you know, the focus on reducing uh, health disparities in healthy people um, or the CDC initiatives like Healthy People 2000 and, you know, um, so forth. And then I'll highlight that even, uh, you know, in last year, in April uh, of 2021, uh, you know, following the confluence of the COVID-19 pandemic and also the racial justice uprisings, the CDC, it was the first time that they declared racism um, as a key determinant of health, um, which is what you see reflected. So I think in terms of big picture health disparity, the focus on health disparities in the United States context is still less than 40 years um, old. And so there's still, you know, a lot of, I think, future um, discoveries and opportunities ahead in terms of addressing and advancing health equity. Uh, in terms of key definitions, I'll just sort of have this last uh, point, which is a, a figure that's taken from another terrific uh, paper that was sponsored by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health um, Disparities, which uh, tried to differentiate between research that focuses on the causes of health disparities versus the effects, where causes or health determinants might include the behaviors, the biological and, and interplay of those factors, the sociocultural, physical environment, and health and healthcare systems that influence disparate outcomes, which are the effects. And health disparity outcomes would include higher incidence prevalence, including early onset or more aggressive progression of particular conditions, uh, premature excessive mortality from specific conditions, greater global burden as indicated by population health measures, poor health behaviors and clinical outcomes, or worse self-reported outcome measures that reflect daily functioning or symptoms from specific conditions. Again, the idea is that you would observe these health disparity outcomes among health disparity populations or those populations who are more likely to experience uh, marginalization uh, due to structural racism. Um, and again, just reminding everybody that reducing and eliminating disparities in health and its, the, and its determinants are the metric for assessing health equity. So again, just underlying what the principles behind this kind of research um, are or should be. Now I wanna sort of shift gears with those definitions in mind to just provide this 50,000 foot view of sleep and sleep disparities. 
And I'll start by emphasizing that one uh, in three U.S. adults are sleepless in, the, in America, where sleepless is defined as sleeping less than seven hours per night within uh, a two-week period. And what you will see here from this figure is that there's substantial geographic variation in the prevalence of short sleep duration in the country, where there's a concentration of um, short sleep. The prevalence of short sleep duration is really concentrated down here in the stroke belt. We also know that sleep uh, disturbances, not only short sleep duration, contribute to poor health, including increased risk of cardiovascular disease, depression, obesity, diabetes, cancer, death, work absenteeism, and accidents. And importantly, that these racial that these uh, sleep disturbances are not evenly distributed across the population, with racial and ethnic minorities uh, more likely to be disproportionately burdened by racial by sleep disturbances compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and this is results from one systematic review, though there, there have been several others published recently, uh, to show that racial ethnic minorities, um, such as folks who identify as Asian, Black, Hispanic, Latinx. Uh, are more likely to have shorter sleep durations compared to non-Hispanic whites and uh, poor uh, sleep quality, though the um, evidence is much more consistent for uh, black-white differences in sleep duration. I'll also highlight that in other dimensions of sleep, there's either insufficient evidence or uh, mixed uh, results regarding uh, differences uh, um, in these categories by race and ethnicity. These trends uh, in terms of differences are, are persisting over time. So I just wanna share uh, this article that just came out, I think a couple of weeks ago in JAMA Network Open uh, that highlighted that um, rate par in particular that for uh, in a time span from 2004 to 2018, when they looked at data from the National Health Interview Survey that black uh, adults continue to show persistently um, uh, higher uh, prevalence of short sleep duration compared to other uh, racial um, ethnic groups. And there's some really sort of interesting patterns in this um, paper, but sort of just highlighting that these trends are persisting over time. Given my interest in, in trying to uh, really understand how sleep connects to cardiovascular disease, um, this I just wanna highlight uh, this research that was conducted with um, uh, colleagues at the uh, medical center uh, that followed adults who were just hospitalized um, and discharged from the hospital after suffering an acute coronary syndrome and with this and followed them for a year and tracked their sleep for the month subsequent to their uh, discharge from the hospital. And what they found is that for black uh, patients who slept less than seven hours, these um, individuals had the highest risk of suffering from another major adverse cardiovascular event, including death, heart attack or unstable angina compared to all other groups. And just an important note on terminology, um, as we move on, I've, I've showcased several different uh, either systematic reviews or articles that highlighted um, differences by race and ethnicity, but I, I, I do think it's important to highlight that race and ethnicity are his are social and historical constructs. They do not reflect genetic differences between the race, between races or ethnicity. And importantly, that the race variable is often used as a proxy for exposure to racism, um, but it's not directly measuring racism. So those are important measurement and methodological issues that have to be, and limitations that have to be acknowledged as we interpret the data and talk about future directions. As um, I shared with you all, I do um, observational research. I also am very interested in intervention-based research. Um, and so, you know, what do we know about uh, sleep disparities in treatment? Um, uh, our team uh, conducted a systematic review of the state of science of behavioral sleep medicine interventions and health disparities populations and reviewed all RCTs from inception to um, January of 2020 and found that only about 7% targeted underserved group and uh, well, the underserved groups are the uh, categories that are listed to the right. And I'll just highlight that none of these randomized control trials explicitly focus on immigrants, LGBTQ+, linguistic minorities, and only about 9% um, focus on racial ethnic minorities. So a key question is what contributes to these disparities in sleep, health, and treatment? 
And, you know, I think in answering any of these kinds of disparities focused questions, it's really important to draw from strong conceptual and methodological models. I'm here um, showing you the social determinants of health framework from the World Health Organization, but there's so many different versions um, that can be uh, used. And what's important about this model, and, I, and again, I think that is important um, to uh, refer to as we talk about future directions is that this model highlights not just how structural determinants, so think about these more macro levels are both directly um, uh, uh, associated with health and well-being, but also how they are indirect, indirectly shape health and well-being through their impact on on these intermediary factors like behavior, psychosocial factors and material circumstances, and also how, how these macro level factors interplay with a socioeconomic status, ethnicity, race, education, occupation, and income. So, you know, it's really important to highlight, to draw from strong uh, conceptual models of the, of the role of um, structural factors in affecting sleep health. And this is just one of them. So, now, what are some scientific trends and opportunities? And um, I, I'm providing six different scientific trends and opportunities. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list, and I'll try to sort of share some, um, you know, high-level thoughts on it. The first trend is that it's, it, you know, as I mentioned, um, health disparities is a is a relatively new uh, area, less than 40 years old, um, and sleep health disparities is even newer. Uh, there's been a proliferation of research that's documenting sleep health disparities, but it's it's really, um, I think, uh, we're starting to get to the point where beyond documenting sleep health disparities, how can we think about conducting more uh, anti-racist sleep health research that really centers health equity principles and focuses on the root causes? So this is this would be, again, shifting away from uh, uh, describing differences by race, but looking at the real the root causes such as structural racism and exposure to racism and discrimination. Uh, the second scientific trend um, is that, uh, you know, we continue to see the treatment of racially and ethnically minoritized groups as monolithic, um, which is, you know, sort of uh, grouping uh, um, all sort of uh, racial ethnic groups as, as one or even with subgroups, uh, treating them as homogeneous populations. But there's been a lot of um, studies to show particularly um, across racial ethnic groups, the importance of disaggregating sleep health data among minority, minoritized groups. I know that there's some exciting uh, research, for example, that's going to uh, focus on understanding sleep health among Asian Pacific Islander uh, identified um, populations. So that I think that's an uh, exciting opportunity for, and, and worth uh, further exploration. The third uh, scientific trend is this prevailing use of deficit frameworks. Um, and what I mean by that, it's still, you know, research that's trying to understand, uh, you know, what is it about a population that's leading, um, that's leading to worse sleep outcomes, instead of shifting to a resilience framework, which is, what is it about, you know, specific subgroups within a population that is uh, leading to, to good sleep health? So the, the identification of sociocultural resilience factors for sleep health in minoritized populations, and how can we look at and understand how sleep uh, promotes health within minoritized populations and the, and the ways in which that, that happens. The fourth trend, um, it, which is exciting, you, you, uh, there's definitely been more uh, research that's analyzing sleep patterns among intersecting social identities. So one example is research that's uh, trying to you know, report outcomes by uh, race, um, and gender, race, and sexual orientation, for example. Um, but it is there an, an important opportunity is, is to really explicitly incorporate intersectionality frameworks at each stage of the research process. So a priori, in an a priori fashion. And what I mean here is not just in reporting the outcomes, but how the research is formulated, how the research is conducted, um, that really is trying to understand how you know, social identities are linked to power um, uh, and how that shaped lived experience and the lived ex experience of someone's sleep health. Uh, the fourth, uh, the fifth scientific trend that I'll mention is, um, and as an interventionist, I'm excited to see this and yet you know, see 
opportunities, which is the focus on individual level uh, interventions to address sleep health disparities. Um, we really need to move and have more of an express focus on multi-domain and multi-level interventions uh, that address the root causes of sleep disparities that I talked about. Some of these multi-level interventions are, you know, how can you design homes to promote um, how can you design homes to promote better sleep? How can you address issues of light pollution, um, employment, you know, uh, policies, um, school start times, et cetera? The last current scientific trend is that there's a lot of excitement in the use of digital therapeutics or health technologies and machine learning to address disparities in sleep um, medicine. And an important opportunity is how can we consider and really center um, equity uh, and health equity as we um, leverage these uh, digital technology. So how could we explicitly consider issues of, of digital equity concerns and incorporate these social determinants of health for frameworks and in intervention design? This is um, personally salient for me as someone who's conducting uh, an R01 right now that's adapting a digital CBTI uh, treatment for insomnia, where we've had to really wrestle a lot with what is it, how, how do you um, attune to equity issues in using a lot of these novel uh, and innovative digital um, health technologies. And I just sort of wanna um, highlight sort of two studies that I think um, do this really well. This is uh, one study uh, led by um, senior author, uh, Dr. Yip, that followed a, a group of multi-ethnic adolescents in an intensive longitudinal design. I won't go into the sp specifics, but what they found is that for adolescents who slept longer and better, the night before if they face um, high discrimination, they actually were engaging in greater problem solving and greater use of peer support. So sleep seemed to be promote healthy coping in these individuals and how interesting would it be and important to, to you know, unpack what is, um, how is sleep helping to promote this healthy coping and what would multi-level interventions that help um, uh, these group of adolescents cope with minority stressors, what, what would a multi-level intervention look like that could build off of something like this? That's leveraging school context, for example. Um, lastly, you know, this is a great, also a great conceptual model uh, from colleagues that's really drawing on this socio-ecological model of sleep and circadian health that has different multi-level intervention strategies, again, from the very individual, which are some of these mobile technology and web-based interventions that I discussed, all the way to the macro, which are public policy. There's been, you know, research on school start times, for example, that is starting to really look at the effects um, and whether the effects are equitable um, across different racial ethnic groups or, or uh, different uh, socioeconomic groups. So that remains, I think, to be seen. And I'll highlight also the results of um, this terrific study by Dr. Uh, Bonak that is currently in development. I believe they just finished uh, enrolling their last participant in February, but this is the Sleep Health Literacy and Head Start program with their idea was to conduct uh, a step um, a step, uh, a wedge uh, RCT design where um, it's really addressing uh, sleep, um, promoting sleep health among, uh, leveraging Head Start to promote sleep health among children. Um, so again, just sort of want to highlight existing uh, examples of multi-level interventions that are trying to, I think, address um, issues of sleep health disparities from, from this multi-level, multi-domain perspective. So in conclusion, sleep Disparities um, research, I think, really needs to foreground health equity values and, and principles. Um, remember, just recalling that earlier article that re reduction and or elimination of sleep disparities is the only metric to assess whether we're advancing health equity. And there really is an urgent need for multi-level, multi-domain interventions to address sleep health disparities. And so I think a critical question is how can we incentivize, promote research that focuses on the reduction or elimination of sleep health disparities if indeed our goal is to move towards health equity and sleep health equity in particular. So I'll end there and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Carmela, thank you so much for that absolutely fantastic presentation. And it is very important to start with the definition and put it into context and framing. And that helps us have a conversation because if you can't define it, 
it's really hard to actually research it. I also love the fact that you talked about the opportunities and, you know, something that really sticks out in my mind is when we're talking about these deficit frameworks and deficit models and moving away from that. Uh, so we appreciate that and uh, we look forward to the Q&A at the end. So uh, everyone who's listening live, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A and they will be addressed at the live panel at the end. Uh, and so next up, we have Dr. Ignacio Tapia and Dr. Tapia will talk about sleep in special populations, pediatric OSA and children with Down syndrome. Uh, Ignacio, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll start sharing my screen. Thank you. So I don't have any conflict of interest. The learning objectives are to identify sleep disorders in individuals with Down syndrome, specifically pediatric OSA, recognize research challenges in this population, and also provide the highlights of funded Down syndrome protocols and the strides that we have made so far. So I have to say that I was fortunate enough to participate in a working group for NIH to define what are the clinical, the critical gaps to conduct clinical trials in individuals with Down syndrome. I put the reference there so you can read it, but basically we have this huge, huge, you know, system of planets and we're just here. We have a lot, a lot of strides to continue to make to continue helping this population. So we're just a little tiny grain of, of salt here. First, as a background, obstructive sleep apnea in children with Down syndrome is very prevalent. It affects about 50% of them, and that's a very conservative estimate. If we compare to typically developing children, they are affected about 5% only. So in children with Down syndrome, it's like 10% increase. Based on this, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends an evaluation of sleep at six months. That is a little loose definition. And also to conduct a polysomnogram at age four in all children. There have been some research that actually the latter is a little bit difficult to, to do all over the United States and certainly in other countries that also follow the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for reasons that I'm going to detail later. Another important point is that many children with uh, obstructive sleep apnea and Down syndrome do not resolve after adenosine selectomy, which is the first line of treatment recommended so far. Children with, uh, or individuals in general with Down syndrome have an increased risk of obstructive sleep apnea, basically due to midfacial hypoplasia, glossoptosis, hypotonia, comorbid obesity, and hypothyroidism. This crowds the upper airway, so affects a little bit of the anatomy, overall the midfacial hypoplasia, glossoptosis, but also the hypotonia impairs neuromotor function that is uh, not able in this case to open the upper airway and resolve this air collapse during sleep. Untreated OSA also in individuals in general, and this has also been proven in, in studies in children with Down syndrome, where they have participated with children who are typically developing, is associated with neurobehavioral deficits, systemic hypertension, possibly elevated cardiometabolic risk. And also interestingly, there is a possible link with early dementia. This is particularly important in individuals with Down syndrome as they do develop Alzheimer-like dementia earlier than individuals without Down syndrome. And it's possible that OSA is a modulator for this and we can modify it. Along these lines, I want to introduce you to the work of ho Kim at the University of Southern California. He's a, science, a neuroscientist who has done analyzed big data of sleep EEG of adults who are healthy and a sleep EEG of adults with OSA. And we, what you can see here that he came up with this brain age index on the x-axis. We have the chronological age of these all adult participants with and without OSA. And he um, concluded that those with OSA have an older brain compared to the chronological age if we follow here the blue curve. So the gray curve is those for healthy individuals and the blue curve for individuals with obstructive sleep apnea. And he and I were talking recently and um, we have um, exciting ideas to continue this work in, in individuals with Down syndrome and in children with Down syndrome because actually this can be like a game changer. And I'm certain that we can do better and screen people better for OSA. So what we know also in, in children with Down syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea is that we use the polysomnogram, and that is the index, the obstructive apnea hypomnia index, as the main outcome. We see that this improves in only a portion of children 
with Down syndrome after adenosine selectomy. It may be that polysomnography is not the best outcome for these studies, and we have to focus on something else. For example, what about data and functioning? This is very important for the families. When I treat uh, clinically children with Down syndrome and we explain about the OHI, the family say, yeah, okay, whatever, but what about, will my child be more awake? Would he or she be able to follow more instructions, be more focused or be less tired during the PT sessions, for example? Those are really important questions for the families. So what about quality of life? That's very important. So we may have a child with Down syndrome that maybe the OHI goes from 30 to five, but quality of life improves significantly. And maybe that's fine for the family. We have to further define diet, that. And what about cardiometabolical outcomes and family center outcomes? Also, because of um, many children with obstructive sleep apnea do not resolve after a denotonselectomy, they are referred for positive airway pressure initiation, either CPAP or BiPAP, and that also has some challenges. So what's next? So what is the unknown? We have many unknown. For example, for diagnosis and treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, there is a paucity of in-lab polysomnography or pediatric dedicated sleep lab with personnel who are trained in individuals with developmental disabilities. This deters many families to go to the sleep lab because it's a big ordeal for them to have the child sleep in a foreign environment. Also, we don't know what is the best screening tool. In the best of the world, or in a better world, it would be great to have like a one at home screening tool that every year, you know, you can send a text to your patient and say, okay, it's the time for the child to complete the screening tool, whatever that we, we agree that that would be. And according to results, they will be derived to in lab polysomnography or something else like home sleep apnea testing. For example, there is a role if for ho in home screening or diagnosis. Maybe we can use home sleep, uh, sleep apnea testing in this population. We don't know if adenotonselectomy should be the first line of treatment in these children. Research so far, observational, shows that many of them do not resolve after adenotonselectomy. So the big question is what about if we don't do adenotonselectomy and we just do something else? You know, and there are not, um, there are not um, many randomized controlled trials in this population addressing these questions. In terms of patient-centered outcomes, for example, what are the appropriate neurobehavioral testing for children with Down syndrome? We typically have used in the batteries that have been used in, in typically developing children, and some of those work very well in children with Down syndrome, some do not, so we still have work to do there. Also, families may experience different challenges than those of typically developing children, either for be diagnosed or treated. As I mentioned, you know, sleep studies may face some duress, and also some of the treatments may be complicated to families because they already have to attend OT, PT sessions, individualized learning plans, for example. It becomes something else that they need to do and fit in the 24-hour schedule. And also families may be interested in smaller strides, and this is something that I have learned for my own patients, one mom whose child was being treated for um, obstructive sleep apnea with CPAP, we were talking about adherence and how it is improvement to do a smaller stride. And she said, you know, I'm super happy with the one person rule, all the challenges that my child and I have had, I have resolved in that way. I go the 1%, great, and we stay there. And then we'll go for the next 1% and we stay there. So that means that whatever a time frame that we think is good for typically developing children, it may be a little bit longer for individuals with Down syndrome, but that doesn't mean that they cannot make the same, they cannot meet the same outcomes. It's something that we have to continue to challenge ourselves on that. So what are the challenges, right? I mentioned the testing required for diagnosis. In this case, the polysomnography is a major challenge because of availability for these studies that we'll discuss in the next slides. We are based in Philadelphia and we have been contacted by families, for example, from North Dakota, from Puerto Rico, one from Ireland interested in participating because they don't have availability of sleep studies where they live. There, there is the rest for the families as they have to spend the night with the child in the lab. Also, it can be expensive, and many times it may not be fully reimbursed by insurance. And also, what is the tolerance of the children to all the leads that we need to place? So all that plays a role. And the data that I have here is data of typically developing children, but it shows that 90% of children who were treated for adenotron selectomy for presumed OSA never had the diagnosis made by polysomnography because it wasn't really available for them. So this can be even more in children with Down syndrome. And that um, 
you know, make us um, question whether did they really have OSA? Was the surgery really needed? You know, the risk benefits for any surgery. Surgeries, even though the transelectomy is one of the most performed surgeries in the United States, it still has complications. So those are important questions to take into place. So based on all this, we propose an R21 uh, uh, funded by the INCLUDE initiative to conduct home sleep apnea testing and compare uh, with polysomnography in youth with Down syndrome aged 10 to 20 years of age. The main aim was the tolerability, family reported perception and experience. Also, we studied feasibility and finally the diagnostic accuracy for moderate to severe or say. The latter, the accuracy was not the first aim because first we wanted to explore whether families would be open to this technology and whether children would tolerate that. And if they didn't, well, it, it would become a little moot point. So we recruited 35 uh, youth aged 10 to 20, and both had in-lab PSG and HSAT home sleep apnea testing in any order. This was not a randomized control trial, so they were not randomized to one or the other. And then the families and some of the children also completed questionnaires. In order to, do, to help them with the setup, as you can see there, this is a photo of a real life of a participant who gave us permission to publish the, the picture. Part of the setup was done in the lab and the rest at home. And we did two videos that I leave the link there so you can watch them. They're very interesting to show how the setup goes in the lab and how the family has to complete the setup at home. This is the pulse socks that they use also during the study. We uh, tested 34 children aged 12 to 18 with a median age of 10. And OHI is there, was on the moderate to severe range, as you can see. And the important things that we concluded when we asked the, the families how long did it take for them to set up at home, as you can see there, it was very feasible because many of the families said that it was a short time for them to continue the setup at home. It was very easy for them to place the hand oximeter or to place the nasal cannula. However, some things come off during the night, as you can see there. But the good thing is that families were able to replace whatever came off during the night, that the test seems usable for them, easy to use for them, and overall the experience was good or very good in 87% of the cases. So all of this is very encouraging. And this is the picture of the same child sleeping. So, and then we asked them which test was easier for them, for the families, right? And we found out that home and sleep apnea testing was much easier for most of the families on the x-axis. X-axis, we have absolute numbers. Some still prefer in-lab tests, and I think that's equal to, to any technology that we have. And now, for example, that we are in the work from home, if you ask some people, some people will still prefer go to the office, some will still prefer work to, from home, and that's totally fine. The more options we have for them, the better it is. And the same thing applies for population with Down syndrome. Which test do you prefer? Uh, many families prefer home sleep apnea testing, most of them. Some prefer the in-lab test because they want to have someone monitoring what's going uh, on during the night. And as always, there were some who were unsure. And then what test was easier for the child? Most of them prefer the home sleep apnea testing because they prefer the child to sleep at home. So we concluded that HSAT appears to be feasible and well accepted for families. Then moving on regarding the correlation of polysomnography with HSAT, I will walk you here through the graph we have on the x-axis, the obstructive apnea hypomnia index, or AHI, obtained by the in-lab PSG. And as you can see, we had a full range of cases of severity. And on the y-axis, we have the HSAT or AHI of the same child. So all of this is per data, and these are fitted values, and the grain lines are the 95% confidence interval where the values would be. Now we're going to pay attention to this, and th since we're all talking sleep here, this curve reminds me a lot of the curve of um, sleep, uh, sleep time versus age, you know, that we have here. When we have a bigger ages, like older children, they have a, a wider dispersion. We have the same thing here, that the test were very, was very accurate, as you can see here. However, so in the o a higher values of OHI in the lab, didn't correlate that well with the higher values of ASAT. However, the good news is that if we think about that this test will, um, the goal of this test is to recommend a treatment, right? So if a child has an OHI of 100, for example, in the sleep lab, and that OHI at home is 60, it doesn't really matter because the child will be treated anyway. So if I have a family who's reluctant to come to the lab, and they will say, okay, I will do the home sleep apnea testing at home. And I say, you know, your OHI is 50, you need to be treated. 
is the same conclusion that I would have had if I only have had the PSG. So all of this is good news. And we have a good sensitivity and specificity, as you can see there. Also, I want to show you that something that may influence this, while the eight set values were lower than the in-lab PSG, is because the total sleep time, if we compare the PSG in-lab versus the eight set at home, was greater at home, which is not surprising because in the lab, you know, many times the, the technicians were 12 hours around 6, 6.30 a.m. They wake up the children. Some children sleep longer hours. We found out that in the at home, for example, because they were able to start the recording whenever their real sleep time was. And many children would sleep until 9 or 10 a.m. if they did it on the weekend. They got a significant more hours of sleep. We can see here in blue is the hours of sleep with the in lab PSG and in red with the eight set. And we have the line is the median and the interpolar range is the box. We can see that children at home slept up about one hour more than in the lab. So all this is good news. And because it's the denominator possibly, you know, you divide by longer hours and results in a smaller number. Also another study that, we, that was funded by the INCLUDE initiative was the a positive airway pressure in children with Down syndrome. This is an R6133. We're now in the randomized control trial phase. But I want to share with you some results of the R61 phase, the preparatory phase, where we did qualitative interviews of families of children with Down syndrome who had been treated with, with CPAP or BiPAP for at least six months to find out where, what are the determinants that were important for them and um, how they could help us craft the trial, what were, were the family-centered outcomes that were important for them. And we found out, for example, we had a group with high adherence and a group with low adherence. And here we are going only to read the quotes in red. You know, patience was a theme that came across the board, you know, a slow down, let the child dictate the timeline. You know, they have to be in their own timeline, give them some ownership of what they need to do. And for example, this is very cute when a family says here, like thrill, uh, thrill when they bought a ribbon. So they got to pick the ribbon. Many times we say name the device and things like that. For example, like make it fun. Also visual support. In general, individuals with Down syndrome are more visual. So that's also why we did the videos and we develop a storyboard for them, a social story, and let them discover some things with them, for themselves. For example, playing with the mask before getting them used to it so they can get used to it, let them play with the tubing, for example. One, one family put here that they would be very happy to, to write a book about uh, sleep apnea and children with Down syndrome with, with, um, with figures, for example, with drawing, so information they can understand to their level. Also parents, um, another thing that we identified was the positive reinforcement, how it was very important for the parent to reinforce the child continuously, you know, to get them, again, play with the mask here. The theme of the elephant came all the time. I have one child say, saying that, oh, it looked like an elegant elephant when they had the mask and the tubing. So it's very fun helping them that way. And also the social support. So these are families who have a lot going on. As I mentioned, they have OT, PT. They have other uh, therapies that they have to do. And then we tell them, now you have to do this extra step. So this when it comes to the piece of the social support, you know, when you need a village to raise a child. And that's it's absolutely true in this case and something that came up from the qualitative interviews was that the whole family had to work at it it wasn't only for example the, the mom or the dad who had to be on it everybody has to be in the same cause also there are some cases where children for example split uh, had split houses they live with dad some days and with mom other days so actually it was important for them to be in the exact same page what they're saying here for example and some opportunities that, that they need that they need the social support so the child doesn't miss out in some things like overnight trips, for example, because nobody can take care of the pap and that sort of things. And there's a mom complaining here about the husband that look at something that the mom has to do. And obviously that's not the way that it's going to work. So this data is qualitative data. We have submitted for publication. Unfortunately, a lot of journals are not used to qualitative data. So it has been a more challenging that I anticipated because even though I, I'm, I'm in conflict with this data, I thought it is, I think it's great data, but I'm confident we're going to get published in the next few months so I can share that with you. 
Also, in terms of the adherent children with Down syndrome, this is not data of the randomized control trial. This is retrospective data of children with Down syndrome that we have taken care of at CHOP. And here we have a retrospective review of this of children who have been treated with CPAP for two years at least. And we see that if we look at the percentage of the nights that they use, it's pretty good. In the first month, 12, um, 6 to 12 months, 12 to 18, and 18 to 24 overall, it keeps like a, like around 60 to 70 percent or so. So it's very good, and there's no difference between the the four groups of age. And if we analyze the same data in according to the minutes of use and for every night use, we have that the first six months they use it later, and then they go up, and they keep so up up at a certain level, but they need this content reinforcement regarding the use of that. So in conclusions, sleep in individuals with Down syndrome has not been well studied. OSA is very prevalent in this population. Trials of treatments of OSA in this population that are needed, and maybe they need to be an adapted trial. And also home sleep apnea testing may have a role for the diagnosis of children with Down syndrome. Now, in terms of future research, we need better at home screening tools. We need a device, omics, for example, like a urine sample and something comes up and say, okay, now you are a higher risk of OSA than you were last year. And then you need to go to in-lab or home sleep apnea testing. We need a randomized controlled trial of home sleep apnea testing individuals with Down syndrome. And I think this will happen soon. Also, we need data-driven screening algorithms, something similar, for example, with the EEG data that I show you, and to further define the relationship between OSA, aging, and Alzheimer's in individuals with Down syndrome. So thank you very much. I have all my list of wonderful collaborators there. So I'm only presenting the data here, but actually it's not something that I could do on my own. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ignacio, for that amazing presentation and the overview of the work that you all are doing in the INCLUDE program. For people who might not have caught it, INCLUDE uh, is the investigation of co-occurring conditions across the lifespan to understand Down syndrome. So even though Ignacio's study is in the pediatric population, it is we are quite interested in sleep across the lifespan and very, very excited uh, to see your findings from the R33 portion. Uh, hopefully they're just as exciting or even more so than your R61 uh, in, in your qualitative assessments. So thank you. thank you again, Ignacio. And so we're going to move on now to Dr. Uh, Suzanne or Susie Burdich, who will start her uh, presentation on implementation of sleep inter interventions in underserved communities. Uh, so Susie, we see your slides and take it away. All right. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to come speak this afternoon. And thanks to Dr. Um, Alcantara and Tapia for setting up my talk um, so, ni so nicely. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my topic um, to speak on is the implementation of sleep interventions in underserved community with a real focus on how we can really harness uh, implementation science to promote uh, sleep health equity. So I have some conflict of interest, uh, but I do not think they have any relationship to the material I'm presenting today. So the learning objectives of my talk, um, by the end of this talk, I'm really hoping that the audience will be able to determine where different sleep research studies fall along the clinical translational research continuum to really think about how to consider using implementation science frameworks and methods to broaden perspectives that inform sleep health disparities research, and to reflect on how sleep research protocols and programs uh, can more explicitly consider social determinants of health and structural racism in scope and or in context. So why implementation science? Um, we, we know from research that from the time we have evidence that a certain intervention is efficacious or, or works, um, there's, it's estimated that it takes about 17 years from that finding to actually reach clinical practice. So there's a, a big gap from what we know um, to actually our use of it in the clinical setting. And implementation science seeks to understand and identify and address the barriers that slow the uptake of these proven health uh, behaviors within, pra within practice. And by the def definition, well, one of several definitions of implementation science is that it's a scientific study of methods to promote the systemic uptake of clinical research findings and other evidence-based practices in routine practice 
and hence improves um, the quality and effectiveness of health services research. So what does that really mean? I feel like you know these definitions always sound nice, but it's a little bit hard to understand conceptually. So if we look at consider the translational research spectrum, you know, early when we consider T0 to T1, T2 research studies are our basic, our basic studies and clinical efficacy studies in really controlled research settings and environment that really answer questions such as, could it work? Um, you know, take evidence from research settings to justify action. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why my slides are actually advancing on their own. I apologize, I don't know what's going on with my Zoom. <laughs> um, we have research from us, uh, research settings to justify action. We move from T2, so clinical efficacy, to comparative effectiveness. And then as we move from comparative effectiveness, this really compares to treatment, treatment options, we, we look for evidence to justify action in typical care or population settings. And that's where implementation research works. We move from the could it work in the, in the more basic clinical realm to does it work in comparative effectiveness to how do we make it work? So for sleep medicine, you know, we have a lot of efficacious treatments. We have a lot of behavioral treatments. We have medications for sleep apnea. We have um, CPAP and several other treatments. So we have them, you know, on the left side of, of what do we know, but how do we actually move it across that gap uh, and be able to inform and be part of our armamentarium for what we do? And this is really where we get into implement, impl implementation um, research. And the field of um, and implementation research is designed to really answer this question. And related to, to health uh, equity, as Dr. Colin Contras uh, laid out so nicely, um, you know, we're, we're really shifting from a mindset of equality to, to health equity, where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to, to be healthy as, as possible. And implementation scientists and disparities researchers both work towards a common goal. I'm sorry, my slides are advancing on their own and I don't know why. Um, uh, towards a common goal to receive the highest quality healthcare supported by research evidence. And implementation science can help address these inequities by studying the factors and processes and strategies. And again, as Carmela laid out so beautifully uh, at various levels, patients, physicians, organizations, and help us adapt the more systematic care to influence the uptake of the interventions, the use, and ultimately the sustainability across cl uh, clinical settings and also in community settings. And by that way, we can really harness the tools of implementation um, to help alleviate um, help alleviate the disparities in care to promote equity. So we can really adapt these interventions for various clinical care settings so that everyone can actually have access to use these uh, interventions and have it fit within the context or communities that we receive care, even if these are more under-resourced community settings. So how implementation science goes about that, there's several core elements that I'll just note on briefly. So one of the key cores, which we heard about already, um, is stakeholder engagement. And this really, can, this really starts early on and can start as early on from before we even have an intervention as well. I'm going to show some representative examples of the work. And the idea to engage stakeholders early is that if you don't engage them, by the time you go all the way down that continuum, you know, people may not like the intervention, they may not use it, it may conflict with their values, and it's improbable. So you spend all this time developing and testing an intervention, and then it's never going to be feasibly used. Um, it also can inform the intervention if needed for adaptations to promote uptake um, feasibility uh, for the, the target population, and it also informs the inter intervention strategies that develop. They also use theories, models, and frameworks. Um, and these, these often involve uh, frameworks and theories on individual health be behaviors, because we're often changing a goal, uh, such as and there's a lot, a lot of different health behavior frameworks, specific frameworks on how to translate these evidence-based uh, interventions into practice that not only count 
the actual intervention itself, but takes into account the content setting as well, as well as the outer context. And we'll see some examples of this as well. And they also have several different types of frameworks to look at evaluating the implementation strategy. There's actually a whole website devoted to how to select these various frameworks at these levels, but these actually provide a broader perspective than some traditional disparities research that consider sort of more systematically and more broadly the full context, because the context is so important when we think about trying to use these, these uh, interventions in the real world setting. There's also a lot of work around intervention selection and adapting the intervention, again, the evaluation process, and then the implementation strategies were again are actually not the intervention itself, but separate interventions that are um, that are, that are tested to improve how those initial evidence-based practices are actually used into practice. So what are some represented examples of implementation science in, in, in sleep research? So to start off to give us this, this nice subway map um, that was published a few years ago by some implementation science researchers to answer the question, you know, is something actually implementation science? Because there's a lot of intersecting fields, um, health delivery science research, disparities research, so it's sometimes hard to disentangle what is actually implementation science. So this really lays it out nicely. We're gonna walk through this with a few examples. So uh, on the red line, well, just start, if you have a, identify a practice of interest, so this is actually you know, an intervention you're interested in studying. The first branch on the subway line is whether or not there's actually evidence of efficacy. So has this actually been shown to work for the outcome of interest in a, in a more controlled setting? If not, then you design some efficacy, re efficacy research and you can consider you know, an eye and implementation. If there's some efficacy research, then you move to this, this yellow line, which brings you towards effectiveness research and then the decision tree. Is there some research of it, it working um, in a more real world setting. Uh, if there is, then you actually move into the green lines here, which is actually where implementation research begins that involve more laying the framework towards moving implementation strategies. Then we'll walk through this with some, some examples. So here's my little DC Metro subway car on a red line. So just to give you a quick example of just an efficacy study looking at sleep, sleep health um, disparities, we conducted um, a study where we were developing a sleep health and yoga intervention for low-income housing communities here in Boston. And again, we use some of the some of the concepts of implementation science, even though we were early on. But we worked very closely establishing advisory panels that were multiple multi-stakeholders and included people living in these low-income housing communities, as well as key um, administrative uh, people working in the communities, as well as several other. Um, you know, disp several disparities researchers, sleep experts, um, and helped develop the intervention, helped us think about what, uh, you know, how to actually go about our work. We then did, conducted focus groups and interviews with the residents in the housing community to gather information, you know, to help inform the content of our intervention, you know, what they thought about sleep, um, their beliefs about yoga, and how do we get to overcome barriers and enablers to get them to actually do these sleep and yoga practices, but also to think about just ways to help them even participate in the research. We then did a series of iterative pilots, um, which you'll see is common in, in doing these type of adaptation works uh, that we refined and ultimately you know, did a pilot randomized uh, control trial to look at, to, to start looking at efficacy. So that's an example of a, of a red line study. The next place uh, is actually what we're gonna go to is the, the yellow line. Um, so the what you see on top of the subway car here is actually a, 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 a web-based application called ShutEye that has uh, several efficacy studies showing that it is effective for treatment for insomnia, predominantly uh, across uh, white populations uh, that, have, and that were studied in clinical trials. Um, so recently, uh, so to move it more into the effectiveness now, there's a, a research group also located in, in Boston on a recently published uh, publication of, of the work that came out. So what you see here is sort of snapshots of the original shut-eye intervention. And you can see, you know, there that it includes patient narratives. And obviously most of the patients involved were white. So what was a first step for this intervention, what they did is um, convened a group of stakeholders that advised the overall 
overhaul of the content of the intervention. They kept the core components of the sleep intervention the same, so some fundamental principles, uh, sleep restrictions, stimulus control were all retained in the shut-eye program, but what they did is they replaced all the still photographs and, and videos with black actors for the patient vignettes, and they also filmed uh, videos of black female physicians who served as sleep experts in the program content. Um, then they also, you know, modif made some very mod minor modifications to, to some of the content as well as a way to address neighborhood noise and other uh, specific factors that were needed. And then they did a randomized trial where they randomized a, about 100 patients across each arm to the regular shut-eye intervention, shut-eye BWHS, and then to the control group, which was patient education. And then they found that both of the shut-eye groups um, had you know, clinically meaningful improvement over the control arm. And these groups look the same, you know, as far as clinical response, but a real notable finding is that when they looked at who completed all of the six, session, um, six sessions that comprise of shut-eye, they found that, you know, almost 80% of the shut-eye BWHS participants logged on and, and did each each module were only about 65% of the regular shut-eye participants. So they noticed definitely higher engagement, higher adoption rates of shut-eye, you know, with a, 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 a tailored uh, intervention for this population. So they, this intervention looked at a, a, um, effectiveness research, but if, you know, now that there's effectiveness research, it's really time to take the next step into implementation research. And it could actually be argued that, um, that in the previous study that because we know that shut-eye is such an efficacious intervention, they, they could have considered moving right into this green line of a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial. Um, and that's really sort of a question that you have to consider based on how much evidence there is and what is the previous population and how much of the intervention that needs to be modified. Um, so, so where, where are these hybrid trials just going back to our re research continuum? So as we talked about uh, before, between the comparative effectiveness and implementation research, hybrid designs really combine the T3 and T4 research. So they really um, sort of combine the features of does it work to how do we make it work? And there's really descriptions about three, uh, three types of hybrid trials really ranging on this continuum from effectiveness to implementation trials. So ranging from hybrid type one, type two, type three. So type one trials still primarily look like effectiveness study and that they test effectiveness, but the real value of them is that they observe implementation. When we conduct clinical trials of, of um, interventions, we're implementing the clinical trial. And if we do that in a, a context that's similar to how we envision it being used down the road, by systematically gathering information uh, about our implementation of the intervention, we really can speed up the process because we can do the trial, but we can talk to the patients, talk to the providers, talk to the clinic administrator if the, if the intervention is in a clinic, uh, and actually gain, gain understanding of the barriers and facilitators that that will then inform sort of the next step intervention strategy. So we know the intervention coming into the hybrid type one trial isn't gonna be perfect. It may not be the perfect intervention or one that will be used down the road for implementation, but we can get, gather sort of key knowledge to help um, speed the transition. And really it's, it's not to do that as sort of a missed opportunity. The hybrid two really look at both effectiveness and implementation and the hybrid three look at effect, mostly effectiveness of the implementation trial. So looking at what, um, if I design an implementation strategy, such as, um, you know, uh, using facilita facilitators, internal, external facilitators to uh, implementing intervention. And then secondarily, uh, it observes effectiveness. So you can still observe patient outcomes. So that's the, the, the spectrum of these hybrid implementation trials. And again, the traditional effectiveness outcomes are maybe familiar to a lot of you, you know, symptoms, cost, clinical events, quality of life, but implementation starts to look at you know, how those proven therapies are used. Uh, what's the adoption by the intended audience? What's the feasibility of adopting it? Is it appropriate? Uh, what are the implementation costs and the fidelity of the intervention? 
So as Dr. Alcantara mentioned, she has an AHRQ-funded HYBER-1 effectiveness implementation trial called Dormir Mejor. Uh, we're, sim we're similar to the, the Black Women's Cohort Study, you know, did the key stakeholder um, panels and, and got them involved with reviewing the, the characters. This is also another adaptation of Shut Eye, um, reviewing the vignettes, looking at health literacy, uh, on animations of, of key concepts as well. And this is a, a screenshot of her study. So the key difference of, of her study is that she's conducting a randomized controlled trial to, to test the adapted version of, of the Spanish shut eye. But really what makes this a hybrid study is that she is gathering you know, formally and systemically information on the barriers and facilitators to learn how best am I gonna implement this going in the future and what strategies will I need to take into consideration. So again, um, you know, it sounds nice to have this, this, this subway map planned out, but you know, this also takes a lot of time. So how can we consider thinking about, you know, maybe moving the subway a little fo fo forward faster, right? Because sometimes you really just want a bullet train <laughs> to get things through. But unfortunately, that, uh, that, doesn't always, that doesn't always work, but there are things you can do early on in, in planning to try to speed it through this implementation cycle faster. So this is the work of Ariel Williamson, also at Children's Hospital, who works with Dr. Uh, Tapia too. Um, and what I really love about her work is, like sh that, is that she's gone in and actually has started thinking about um, what is the implementation going to work look like down the road? So she's in the process of um, developing uh, and trialing uh, behavioral sleep intervention strategies for young children in lower SES settings and our racial and ethnic minoritized background. Um, and, you know, she went in and there was an evidence-based intervention from Australia, but when she went in and spoke with her um, target population and went in, you know, met with the families and talked to the clinicians, she realized, you know, this proven treatment is not going to fly <laughs> in this clinical setting. People, people won't use it. It's not acceptable to them. It's not appropriate for their environment. We're going to not just have to develop an intervention strategy. We're going to have to change some of the intervention itself. So though she had to, you know, go and had to reformulate the intervention throughout the developmental process um, of, you know, ongoing and doing her iterative adaptations, she is keeping uh, the implementation in mind, which is so she's gathering information along the way that is ultimately going to speed her down, down the subway track faster than she would have because she's able to keep a mindset on it. So again, um, so those are some examples in sleep research. And I do wanna give some examples of, of implementation research. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any true implementation research studies in, in all of sleep, not just, count, not just looking at the work uh, in sleep that are aiming to reduce uh, healthcare inequities. Um, but I did wanna sort of give a little bit flavor of what these true uh, implementation research studies look like. So there's there's actually many examples already in the literature. And I'm, I just picked um, one example of a colon cancer um, screening uh, study where they're looking to improve colon cancer screening rates in urban fe federally qualified health centers. So here they're evaluating the implementation of three evidence-based interventions. The difference in this implementation, you know, green track of the subway stop is that, you know, they, there's colon cancer screening and the evidence-based interventions here that they're referring to are actually in, interven, implementation strategies. So it can, it includes um, provider feedback of where they are in terms of how many people they screen, and it also includes patient navigators. So these are you know, proven ways that they've been able to boost colon cancer screening rates, but in implementing it you know, across um, more of uh, these federally qualified health centers, they realized they needed to continue to gain information about the context of the work. And they used one you know, very popular um, uh, framework called CIFR or the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Framework that looks at a lot of the contextual and outer setting, uh, different settings and different parts of, of that, of the context of, of, of um, that, what influences the, the uptake of these interventions. And then they're going to use the, the, this qualitative work to then again, come up with actionable items and, you know, refine the strategies to be used to, again, broaden, you know, throughout, you know, the whole system in the Chicago area. 
So this is actually a mapping, a thematic mapping of, of some of the qualitative research they group. What you see here in the colors are the elements that make up the CIFR, CIFR, um, the CIFR uh, framework. So the innovation characteristics, outer setting, inner setting, individuals and process. And through this, they're able to identify barriers such as lack of awareness of colorectal cancer screening among patients, facilitators, this is that peer support of physicians allow them to achieve higher um, colon cancer screening rates for their patients. So if uh, physicians knew their other there are uh, the other physicians they worked with had higher rates that actually helped them do better. And they also identified barriers to the implementation. So absence of print materials to, uh, for the frontline uh, implementers and also facilitators a cultural framework um, uh, to, to facilitate the culture of teamwork and patient-centered uh, care that were already existing at these healthcare centers. So we can leverage these implementation science strategies and frameworks to, to promote equity. So to date, as Dr. Alcantara mentioned, most of, the in, most of the studies have actually focused on patient and provider level interventions, and there's limited studies um, on systematic approaches or upstream social determinants of health, which can actually, uh, as well as a lack of diversity in study samples and setting, and these both can perpetuate health inequities. So as you already mentioned, there's, there's an important need to, to do more multi-level um, approaches for selecting, developing, adapting, and implementing evidence-based interventions to expand past patients and practitioners. So I think, I think the representation that there's a dearth of evidence in this area is that we actually pulled the same study <laughs> as like the example in sleep, because it's the only one that I know of, uh, of the same study she already presented of a sleep health intervention as part of the Healthy Starts program that actually intervene on these multiple levels of the socio-ecological model. Um, and there's actually clearly a need for more research in this area. And just in the last few slides, I also, you know, it's very important and helpful to use these maps. As Yogi Bear said, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. And I think that this is where, you know, these maps can be really helpful. And, you know, we've come a far way in sleep research. And, you know, as mentioned, sleep disparities research is novel. But I think in order to have a more cohesive um, concept of where we're actually aiming to get to, it's really important to know where we are on the map because there's some studies that don't necessarily need to be done. You know, do we need to um, test some of our interventions repetitively in just other types of populations? We know some of them work really well. Why don't we actually just go ahead and do some of these hybrid studies, you know, make the adapt, um, adaptations along the way um, and, and speed up the process. So it's helpful to know where we are on the, on the map. I would argue it's two representative examples. One is for behavioral sleep interventions for insomnia, particularly in underserved populations. You know, I, as the research to date we presented, you know, we're really clearly in the hybrid effectiveness implementation trials, or if you've not potentially further on the spectrum, where we have, you know, efficacious studies, we need to test it in real world settings in these underserved populations. And similarly for sleep apnea, we have multiple proven therapies, um, you know, of, of effectiveness and effectiveness studies that, you know, are used relatively in clinic. But what we don't have and is sorely needed is really a more formative evaluation to understand the context. We're trying to deliver these therapies, reduce disproportional rates of screening for sleep apnea and even treatment uptake of sleep apnea itself, which also then would inform larger implementation uh, strategies and then formal testing of these strategies in a way to really formally test um, some of the ways uh, these strategies themselves can address health inequities. Uh, so again, this is just to reiterate, we need the hybrid studies to promote the evidence-based interventions for underserved populations, more formative evaluation implementation studies. Uh, and these actually will include, you know, what health system factors are impacting the uptake of treatment, what other stakeholders need to be engaged in to inform these strategies as well, as well as explicit recognition of some of the contextual factors, uh, socio-determinants of health, 
that actually influence this. So, you know, what, what are the possible ways in which racism and discrimination may actually factor into these disproportional, um, to the disparities that exist in the, particularly the treatment of sleep disorders. And even though there are interventions won't necessarily target that, it's important to be aware of that context and how it's actually shaping everyone's behavior who's interacting in this space of, of healthcare delivery. And again, there's a clear need for multi-level interventions. And to start, I think, really pushing ourselves as researchers in the field to really start tackling some of these other non-individual related um, issues that, that are impacting and, and contributing to health disparities. So just to put a little plug for those of you planning on uh, attending the Slate meeting in June, um, we're, we have a symposium on, um, on this very topic and Drs. Alcantara, myself, Dr. Williamson, and Eric Zhao, who is one of the, the PIs of the Black Women's Cohort Study, will be presenting our work. Um, and just to end with a quote, um, to him who devotes his life to science, nothing else can give more happiness than increasing the number of discoveries, but his cup of joy is full when the results of his studies immediately find practical applications. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to learning from you all as part of our discussion later this afternoon. Thanks so much again for having me. Thank you so much for that presentation, Susie. It's something that we have certainly been thinking about uh, for a while, the implementation aspect. We know, as you mentioned, that we do have these efficacious interventions, but the uptake uh, of these interventions, especially when you're talking about uh, spe special populations and in the context of health disparities, then really trying to be trying to move that and get the, the effective therapies into the hands of the people who need them most has certainly been a challenge. And we love seeing the data and the research that you presented uh, and showing the way that you are doing this. And so I'm going to invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras uh, for our, our Q&A. And again, just thanking you all for these fantastic presentations. It really, really was quite informative. And so we do have uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A. And, and we'll start with one that even though it's uh, specifically addressing uh, Carmela's presentation, I think I have a little bit of add-on and an ask of Ignacio. So the question, uh, Carmela, is uh, they were wondering if there is any data on racial ethnic disparities when it comes to uh, population in women. And I'll even expand on that a little bit when we're talking about um, race and ethnicity as far as women. Are there disparities, A, overall in sleep when it comes to women and also in the context of special populations? That's a, um, that's a great question. I'm happy to sort of start us off and then, you know, my colleagues can um, jump in. You know, I, I think there has been some great uh, research that documents uh, um, disparities in, you know, and I think when you're talking about sleep, we have to be specific about what the outcome or what the dimension of sleep that we're talking about and how it's measured. Um, but broadly, there's been really interesting research to show, you know, when you start uh, focusing on gender by race and then even occupational status. Like there's there's a, a terrific paper um, that documents differences uh, among women, you know, depending on what kind of uh, occupation they have and also their, their race. And so, for example, Chandra Jackson has a terrific paper, I think that came out several years ago that documented um, that in particular for, uh, I think, Black women in uh, managerial sort of professional type of uh, occupations had shorter sort of sleep durations compared to, um, you know, Black women who were in different uh, occupations and similarly for Latinx women. So I think there's some, but we, I think certainly that's an area um, and I know a couple of years ago, there was an entire symposium dedicated to sleep among uh, women, um, but it's still, I think, an area that's ripe for future research. And I would just sort of say, in many ways, it's also considering other categories. So this idea of occupation, so that you're thinking about not just women and sort of race and ethnicity, but also how does their um, uh, occupation also impact the, you know, their sleep more generally. That's certainly an important point and thinking beyond uh, that these conversations are sometimes a lot more complex than they are originally um, framed out to be. So Susan, uh, Susie or Ignacio, do you want to comment? 
I can, I can just add in, I know Nancy Redeker has done some really interesting um, qualitative work looking in this space in terms of um, sleep health disparities in various dimensions of specifically, I in, in think in the New Jersey uh, area, I can't remember exactly where she was, but to try to figure out how to start, you know, directly tackling because, um, you know, thinking of all the outside influences that actually can impact uh, women's sleep, you know, childcare is a major thing that came up in, in our own research when we were devising the interventions. Um, and almost at every level of the socio-ecological no novel really does have gender differences and how it actually may impact sleep um, throughout the workplace. So, um, you know, some of the disparities are, are documented, but I think especially when we do the qualitative work to try to sort of disentangle where the quanti why we're seeing the quantitative differences, we really need both of those tools to start, you know, addressing the interventions to, to address to address it as well. I agree absolutely with that. And in the terms of the population with Down syndrome, actually that's a big void that we have. For example, we don't truly know if the recommended hours of sleep that are applied to typically developing children or to adults without Down syndrome applies to those with Down syndrome or whether they do have interrupted sleep based on their genetic disposition and things like that. We don't know. And actually, we don't know the, the racial disparities that may be affected. And for example, in one of the papers that we did in children with Down syndrome, we were analyzing big data. And it was very striking to me that uh, we were finding, okay, Caucasian children with Down syndrome or Latinx children with Down syndrome hospitalized for pneumonia, for example, were representative of the U.S. census, but then the African-American children with Down syndrome were not. So that poses a big question, where are those children? And it's something that I think we need to tackle further. There's a lot of work to, to be done there. I, I agree with you, Ignacio, in, in really having this special program dedicated uh, to persons living with Down syndrome is much needed and is um, it's something that we should probably have been considering a long time ago. Uh, but now we are, and it's wide open for the investigation, particularly of, of sleep and circadian research. And the what is unknown is a lot, uh, there's a larger <laughs> gap than what actually is known. Yeah, it's so large sometimes you have, when we, we have this meeting, oh, let's do this, let's do that, and we put the kitchen sink, and we have to say, okay, now we have to do only half of it because we just cannot wear it. Back. <laughs> right, because it, it yeah. is it is so much, and and so one of the things that I kind of wanted to uh, go back to, since it was mentioned in at least two presentations today, was about um, the Head Start program and and you know looking at things in that space. And I guess one thing that I'm interested in, especially when we're talking in the context of uh, eliminating disparities to achieve equity, and we know a lot of these things start very very early. Uh, there's also been conversation for years. Uh, about changes, uh, whether related to school start times to uh, for uh, sleep and circadian health, and just kind of wanted to get um, your take on uh, kind of the implications, particularly when it comes to sleep health and, and children and pediatric, pediatric populations, and some things that could be done or, or what aren't we doing in that space. And this is anybody. It's directed to, to everybody. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just jump in. Um, yeah. I'm, an, I'm an adult internist by training, not a pediatrician. So I'll preface that. But I've been really interested in the early school start times, um, you know, because just in thinking about that in terms of like implementation research, like this is a, the school start times is like a policy level intervention. And in, you know, sort of the gap between the scientists and the policy makers, I think highlight why it's so important to try to, you know, devise some of these interventions or use research to inform some of these policies decisions, because, you know, it has not been a smooth process and it's worked in some areas and not others. And I really think sort of like having, you know, a framework or a map to think about, you know, what needs to be in place for these considerations might, might make it be less maybe they like, have a better coordinated response. I, I sort of see the school start, start time as like a little bit of a lost opportunity in terms of like, of, it could have maybe been smoother um, and then instead of very haphazard uh, than it's been in 
Um, so that, that's sort of what I'll initially say. I also see someone in the chat's also posting some information uh, about other school inter in school interventions, um, you know, for sleep times too. So that there there are there's a lot of work in sort of the, the, the school space. Um, so, so I'll stop there. I wanted to add there is a huge cause for disparity. For example, overall in teenage in teenagers who already can drive. For example, if you have a teenage child who can drive and has access to a car, immediately will sleep longer because doesn't have to wait for the bus like 30, 40 minutes, some of them one hour before the time. So that's something also that has to be put into the equation. Unfortunately, uh, it's not. Many times we encounter the families who are more underserved, maybe farther away from the school, and they're picked up super early. Some kids, 5.45 a.m., things like that, they, they nap on the bus, but it still is not the same. So it's something that uh, it, I think it affects the entire U.S. population. It has to be tackled at, the, at a higher level, as you mentioned, Susie. And it's like a lot of strategies there. I think the teachers are open to have it later school times. There are issues with the drivers, you know, with the lack of childcare, for example, who's going to be with the children at home and that sort of situation that affects the issue as well. Yeah, I, I, oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I, I really do agree that there's, um, it's interesting because it does, it does feel like it's an input or it will soon be an implementation problem or for certain states and for certain sort of regions, it is an implementation question about how best to do it. Although, you know, I think this, there's a lot of, um, empirical questions about what does it do for disparities, right? And I think that's the fear, is this great policy gonna have these unintended consequences in terms of um, disparities? And some research in some you know, uh, regions where this has happened has shown that it hasn't, but it, it's sort of, I think it's so local. And I think that's part of the, the, the challenge associated with, with this is how do you study this in a local context and really get local champions um, and think about it as an implementation science question. But more broadly, I think Marishka, to your question, I you know, it was one of the points that I had, but um, I'm also admittedly an adult person, uh, but it's just the, you know, the fact that we really do need more preventive interventions, right? That focus on sleep and how do we do that? And there's so much interesting work about the dyadic nature of sleep and, you know, the potential role of family-based interventions. I could tell you from the work that I do with Latinx communities, where I talk to parents about their sleep. Um, and in some cases for many of them who might be commuting long, um, and these are mostly immigrant communities who I'm talking to, but who might be commuting long distances, like it's hard for them to, you know, that conversation about how to um, uh, extend their sleep looks um, has different kinds of structural barriers that are harder to address. But then when we talk about 